My name is Anna Kate Hicks, and I'm a freshman from Cincinnati, Ohio. It is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker. Richard B. Gunderman is Chancellor's Professor of Radiology, Pediatrics, Medical Education, Philosophy, Liberal Arts, Philanthropy, and Medical Humanities and Health Studies at Indiana University, where he's also the John A. Campbell Professor of Radiology. He also serves as Bicentennial Professor at Indiana University and as President of the Medical Staff Executive at IU Health. He received his AB from Wabash College and his MD and PhD from the University of Chicago. He is a 10-time recipient of the Indiana University Trustees Teaching Award, and in 2012, he received the Gloucester Teaching Award from the Association of American Medical Colleges. Dr. Gunderman is the author of numerous articles and 15 books, including We Make a Life by What We Give, Tesla, Contagion, and Marie Curie. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Gunderberg. Good afternoon. It's a treat to be here. Um, I didn't know what I was doing when I applied to college, but I stumbled into a very good all-male liberal arts college in uh, northwest central Indiana called Wabash College, actually an all-male institution, was, which was not an enticement to me, but I had a chance to get to, to meet terrific faculty members who opened up uh, intellectual horizons and uh, professional opportunities that I don't think uh, would have even occurred to me, let alone seemed feasible. And then as AK indicated, uh, thanks to them, I ended up at the University of Chicago, uh, pursued fairly conventional medical studies, but uh, was in a program called the Medical Scientist Training Program and uh, got to study in the Committee on Social Thought. Uh, so I went to an undergraduate liberal arts institution and if you read the description of the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, at least at the time I was there, uh, it described itself as, among other things, providing a liberal education at the graduate level. So I'm a person who's had the opportunity to pursue liberal arts education for a long time at uh, a few institutions, and I'm delighted to bring some of that learning today to this talk, which is on the importance of the liberal arts, but we'll be focusing on a physician's view. Would a physician have anything useful to say about the liberal arts? And equally interesting, does the liberal arts have anything to contribute to medicine? So uh, let me start out by correcting what could be a misapprehension that might flow from the title of this presentation. In my view, the liberal arts aren't really separable from medicine, nor are the liberal arts preparation for medicine. In fact, the liberal arts and medicine are largely coextensive. They would overlap a lot on a Venn diagram, at least if we see them clearly. To thrive as a reader or a teacher or a writer of books, one must attend to many of the same things that command a physician's attention. To care well for patients requires the same habits of ear, mind, and heart that the liberal arts aim to cultivate. In both spheres, it takes years, perhaps decades, perhaps even a lifetime, to learn to perceive, understand, and respond with compassion and imagination to the human reality before us. Both spheres require the cultivation of essentially the same human excellences. Consider a story shared with me by one of my favorite medical students, whose name is Muhammad. Muhammad left the hospital one dank winter night, and as he walked to his bicycle, he saw a large mountain of a man 
carrying three bags, approaching him on the sidewalk. The man's intentions were unclear. Did he, for example, plan to ask for money? Did he intend to take it by force? But Muhammad resisted the temptation to cross to the other side. The distance between them soon closed, and soon the man's chest was just inches from Muhammad's face. The man said, do you work here? I need to get to the emergency room. Muhammad replied, it's a few blocks away. The man asked, could you drive me there? Actually, said Muhammad, I rode my bike today. The man took off his backpack, opened it, and handed Muhammad a blanket. He said, here, take this. It's too cold to be out biking. Then the man said, please don't leave me here alone. I'm blind. If you want to learn, teach, or write about the importance of not jumping to conclusions, not writing people off based on how they look or talk or even smell, you could do worse than to read a letter, the greatest physician poet in the English language, John Keats, wrote on a dank winter night in 18... 17 to his brothers, George and Tom. Considering the close relationship of truth and beauty in King Lear, Keats describes what he calls negative capability. Negative capability. The ability to be in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. When we encounter something we're not sure about, an idea, a new way of thinking, a large mountain of a man carrying three bags, Keats counsels us to observe, to be patient, to dwell in uncertainty, and to avoid resorting to predetermined categories. His counsel to patience shines all the more brightly when we consider that Keats himself died of tuberculosis at the age of only 25 years. Keats is like Socrates. If we explain every new thing we encounter, in terms of what we already know, we'll never learn anything new. We'll keep explaining everything as A or B, A or not A, and never recognize that there's also a C, a D, and an E. Socrates was likened by his contemporaries to a torpedo fish or a stingray which jolts its prey, disorienting it. In the dialogues of Plato, Mino wants to enrich his cocktail party repertoire by quoting Socrates' accounts of the virtues. Simeus and Cebes want to know why a person should keep striving to be good even though death comes to the virtuous and vicious alike. But before they can gain real insight, Socrates' interlocutors must first set aside, at least for a time, what they think they know. If they're going to gain new insight, they must first admit that they do not know. Then they can cast off anew in the pursuit of wisdom. They must drink liberally from that most ironic of wellsprings, negative capability. 
reviewing video recordings of hundreds of physician-patient encounters, a colleague of mine determined that we physicians can listen to patients for how many seconds until we interrupt? The answer is 18. We, that is physicians, in the words of Sergeant Joe Friday, we want just the facts. That is just the parts of the story that fit neatly into our preconceptions and we want to them to be conveyed as efficiently as possible. How easily we forget that the patient is sharing with us more than the clues to a diagnosis. The patient is sharing a human experience, one that deserves to be treated as more than a mere means to an end. Paraphrasing Kant, we must never resolve to treat any story as a means to confirming our own preconceptions only, but always at the same time as a source of illumination in itself. What we need, whether taking a history from a patient or reading one of Keats's odes or Plato's dialogues, what we need is the capacity to listen patiently, to hear what is being said, and to allow the story itself to tell us what it means, rather than making the story tell us what we expect or want to hear. Consider another story, this one shared with me by a priest whose name I can no longer recall. As part of his clinical pastoral education, he was assigned to make monthly home visits to a patient named Shirley. Shirley was an elderly woman who lived alone. At every visit, Shirley would talk virtually nonstop, and her visitor soon realized he couldn't get in a word edgewise. Feeling that he was not contributing anything, the priest began to dread his visits with Shirley. She did all the talking, and he felt useless. Almost as soon as he sat down, he found himself looking for opportunities to say that he needed to go. Sometime later, after Shirley died, the priest received a letter from his supervisor in which Shirley went on at length about how much his visits had meant to her. The priest thought he was doing nothing, but by being there and listening to Shirley, he was providing exactly what she needed. In this, the priest is recalling a lesson of the greatest physician dramatist in world literature, Anton Chekhov. Chekhov practiced medicine all his adult life, right up to his premature death from tuberculosis at the age of 44 years. In his short story, Yearning, we are treated to a ringside seat on human loneliness. A poor cabman, a taxi driver, we might say, named Iona, tries to share with his fares what is weighing heavily on his heart. His son, who should have succeeded him, has recently died of a febrile illness, leaving the old man all alone. First, Iona reaches out to a military officer, intent on reaching his destination as efficiently as possible. Then he reaches out to a group of three drunken young men looking for a good time. Then he reaches out to a fellow cabman. And finally, he's left with his own mare. 
who seems to listen as she munches on hay. He says to her, now suppose you had a little colt, and suppose that little colt all at once went and died. You'd be sorry, wouldn't you? The practice of medicine, like the study of great literature, reminds us that sometimes what we human beings most need is someone to listen, someone just to be there. Recall the book of Job. Job, the greatest man in all the East, righteous and upright before God, has lost everything, his property, his children, his own health. He's fallen as far as a human being can possibly descend, and he sits in ashes, scratching himself with pot shards. When his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, arrive on the scene, they resist the temptation to launch into sophisticated philosophical and theological explanations or justifications for what has befallen Job. They simply sit down silently at their friend's side, remaining there for seven days and seven nights. To be sure, they will later stray from this path, but their first impulse is their best, simply to be there. We can't fix poverty, ignorance, injustice, or terminal illness. We certainly cannot fix mortality, but we can recognize our part and play it well not the part of the immortal and ageless gods whose lives in Homer sometimes resemble nothing more than daytime television drama, but the human part, the part of Achilles and Priam and Hector whose only hope for coming to life lies in recognition of their shared humanity. Achilles must see his father in Priam, and Priam must see his son in Achilles. Achilles must see himself in Hector, and Hector must see himself loaded up in battle gear through the eyes of his terrified son. It is our capacity to be there in the sense of occupying someone else's space, inhabiting their reality that constitutes one of humanity's saving graces. When we see through the eyes of another, we gain a more complete vision of the human situation. Like many academic hospitals and health systems, in Indianapolis we have a program called No One Dies Alone. Its purpose is not to sustain a failing pulse or respiration for as long as possible, but to recognize the inevitability and even the appropriateness of dying and trying to enable people to die as well as possible. There are good deaths and bad deaths. And often one of a physician's most urgent missions is to recognize and respect this difference and work on behalf of patient and family to midwife a good death. This means addressing one of the most common fears I encounter with patients about dying, dying alone. Volunteers simply sit by the bedside of dying patients. Sometimes they hear nothing but agonal respirations, but other times they hear stories, and sometimes the stories are rather like those of Chekhov's cabman. When they listen with eyes and ears and heart open, they are granted the opportunity to answer the human call. Consider another story. This was shared with me by the daughter of a man deceased long ago. In the first half of the 20th century, 
Otis Bowen, M.D., grew up the son of a teacher in northwest Indiana. Otis Bowen's father had eight grades of students in a one-room school where he functioned as teacher, janitor, and nurse, carrying wood and water to the schoolhouse and earning $2.50 a day. Bowen decided to follow a different path and become a physician. To get money for college and medical school, he hoed potatoes for 10 cents an hour. He milked a cow morning and night for 10 cents a day. He mowed grass for 25 cents a yard, 35 cents for large yards. And he shocked oats and wheat for a dollar a day. Bowen persevered, eventually graduating from the Indiana University School of Medicine, serving in the Pacific Theater in World War II, setting up his own practice in rural Indiana, delivering 3,000 babies over the course of his career, including five generations in one family and attending all of his patients' funerals. He also won election to the state legislature, served as Speaker of the House of the Indiana House of Representatives, became the first governor in Indiana to serve eight consecutive years, and then served as U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services during the Reagan administration. Otis Bowen was known as Doc throughout his adult life. And over the course of his career, he found himself devoting more and more of his time to public service and less to medicine. Once, though, relatively late in his life, a woman came up to him. She reminded him of the days when, much earlier in his medical career, he had served as coroner of Marshall County. She called to his mind a case he had been summoned to one day, a middle-aged man killed in an industrial accident. She reminded him that he had performed the autopsy on that man. And she told him that the man on whom he had performed the autopsy was her father. Otis Bowen recalled the event in vivid detail, describing what had happened and how deeply it had touched him. And as he talked, tears streamed down his face. In recalling this encounter with the mortal remains of another human being, I suspect Bowen had encountered his father's mortality his own mortality, the mortality of humankind. Bowen had developed personal relationships with famous people, including U.S. presidents, vice presidents, speakers of the House, Senate majority leaders. He moved easily among the wealthy who sought to curry the favor of government officials. He achieved unprecedented political success in his home state and assumed responsibility for the largest department in the federal government. Otis Bowen was, in short, a big deal, and his calls would be taken by the most famous, richest, and powerful people in our country. But what really moved him, what brought him to tears, was not seeing his name on the front page or securing a financial windfall or winning high office. What really touched him was an encounter with two human beings, one long dead and the other the decedent's offspring. It was akin to the encounter between Achilles and Priam. Such encounters are the distinctive privilege of physicians who are called upon not merely to pronounce death or assign it a cause, but also 
to witness it and feel its significance. We adopt disguises, we human beings. We load ourselves up with titles, riches, authority. Yet no matter who one of us happens to be, or would like respecters of persons to think that we are, underneath we are all human. Even the most famous, richest, and most powerful people are made of the same flesh and blood as the weakest, the poorest, and the most obscure. They too wailed as infants, suckled at their mother's breast, bounced on their father's knee, railed during school years against the cafeteria food, got butterflies in their stomach on their first date, debated the care of aging parents, and before long found themselves the subject of debate. Our costumes present one reality, but to examine us, to know us, and to care for us, the physician must allow such layers to fall away until the unadorned human being underneath is revealed. The physician's job is not to s dismiss or condemn. The physician's job is to know and care. Much the same could be said for the job of the poet, the philosopher, the theologian. Consider one of the greatest novellas ever penned, Leo Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich. In it, a successful lawyer and judge who has devoted his life to moving up the ladder, maintaining a decorous life, and doing what is expected by those above him. He develops a serious illness. As he wrestles with his own mortality, he discovers that he's not only dying from what I presume to be a cancer of the digestive system, he discovers that he's been dying his whole life, even during his prime, because he has never really lived. In fact, he has known less and less of life's meaning and purpose with each passing year. The things that brought him pleasure, house, car, job title, wealth, prestige, they no longer bring him pleasure. And he feels himself caught up in a web of deception from which he has no means of extricating himself. It's not merely that no one will tell him what he wants to hear, but that no one will utter the truth. You don't want to end up in the position of Ivan Illich, who in the last days of his life finds himself tortured by a thought that he cannot get out of its mind. It occurred to Ivan Illich that what had appeared perfectly impossible before, namely that he has not sped his life as he should have done, might after all be true. It occurred to him that his scarcely perceptible attempts to struggle against what was considered good by the most highly placed of his associates, he had immediately suppressed. What he had been looking for was false. His life had been based on a false premise. His professional duties and the whole arrangement of his life and of his family and all his social and official interests might all have been false. He tried to defend those things to himself and suddenly felt the weakness of what he was defending. There was nothing to defend. Ivan Illich is truly lost. He's positioned himself at the periphery of the human solar system. He's been chasing after shiny things while turning his back 
on the true source of warmth and light. His physicians, like him, have expunged everything real and human from their purely technical practice, and they're not much help. They debate, debate diagnoses and treatment regimens while the human being under their care withers away. Yet they could help. They could recognize that Ivan Illich is dying. They could treat him not as a malfunctioning organ, but as a human being, a creature who, regardless of his age, needs someone to be near, to talk, to listen, and to care. Ivan Illich is a reminder that the best things in life are priceless, that they are almost never represented on resumes or CVs, and that we cannot take them with us. Yet we can share them with others, and in so doing, not diminish, but actually enrich our own supply. For it is in sharing something Ivan Illich has never done, that the things that really matter come to life. These are the physician's most precious resources, time, to spend where the return on investment is greatest, attention to devote to the things that matter most, beauty which lies all around us if we have eyes to see, and ears to hear. Truth, a glimpse into the way things really are. And love, the capacity to share a moment or a lifetime with another person in grieving or rejoicing with them. Ivan Illich is not a protagonist to admire or emulate. He is a portrait of a human life misspent a reminder that even those with their fingers on the pulse of life itself, physicians and other health professionals, can become dangerously distracted from what most deserves our attention. Diagnosing, prognosing, curing, palliating, comforting, these activities work in service to a deeper human reality one that reveals a glimpse of itself every time a baby is born or a person dies. We must do our jobs well, but always mindful of a deeper reality, a thread that Ivan Illich completely lost contact with. Consider another story. A woman with advanced head and neck cancer was scheduled to undergo radical surgery the next day. She had led a life that medic, many on her medical team did not approve of. After the team visited her room and obtained her informed consent, they prepared to exit. But before they did so, she handed each one of them a small plastic bag containing a mustard seed. The members of the team turned and exited in orders of seniority. As the attending surgeon did so, he dropped the mustard seed in the trash. Then the head and neck fellow followed suit, discarding the gift. Then the senior surgery resident, and so on, right down the line until the third year medical student, the junior person on the team, left the room. But this time, instead of disposing of it, the most junior team member tucked the little plastic bag into the pocket of his white coat. His act presents us with questions. What did the patient mean by handing the members of the team plastic bags with mustard seeds in them? What did they mean to her and what did they mean to the team members? And why did the medical student, the most junior person on the team, break ranks and keep his mustard seed gift? Thomas Brown, the greatest physician essayist in the English language, knew the answer to that question. In his masterpiece, The Religion of a Physician, composed in the 17th century, 
He reminds us of truths that have not dimmed a lumen in the long interval since. Those centuries saw a lot since the 17th century in medicine. Since then, we've seen the discovery or introduction of blood cells, bacteria, the use of citrus fruits to prevent scurvy, vaccination against smallpox, inhalation anesthesia, the stethoscope, antisepsis to prevent infection, the germ theory, x-rays, penicillin, uh, blood typing, electrocardiography, chemotherapy for cancer, the double helical structure of DNA, organ transplantation, CT scanners, MRI scanners, the eradication of smallpox from the face of the earth, kidney dialysis, and vaccination as a means of preventing cancer. Wow. There was a lot that Thomas Brown didn't know that we do know. And yet Thomas Brown glimpsed some eternal truths that we all too easily lose sight of. Consider Brown's humanity, which is to say his charity, as expressed in the religion of a physician. It is a barbarous part of inhumanity to add unto any afflicted party's misery or endeavor to multiply in any man a passion whose single nature is already above his patience. This was the greatest affliction of Job and those oblique expostulations of his friends a deeper injury than the downright blows of the devil. It is not the tears of our own eyes only, but of our friends also that do exhaust the current of our sorrows, which falling into many streams run more peaceably and is contented with a narrower channel. It is an act within the power of charity to translate a passion out of one breast into another and to divide a sorrow almost out of itself. For an affliction like a dimension may be so divided as if not indivisible, at least to become insensible. Now with my friend, I desire not to share or participate but to engross his sorrows, that by making them mine own, I may more easily discuss them. For in mine own reason and within myself, I can command that which I cannot entreat without myself and within the circle of another. The liberal arts don't merely inform the practice of the physician Thomas Brown, the physician Thomas Brown does not merely draw on the liberal arts. It would be truer to say that Thomas Brown is a perfection of the liberal arts, and it is through his care of patience that this perfection has taken place. The first Hippocratic injunction is not merely a rule that he chooses to follow, but a habit deeply ingrained in the fibers of his being. Do no harm. To reach out with compassion to those who are suffering has become second nature to him. He knows as he knows that an apple will fall, that he sh if he shares another's pain, the burden of that pain will be lightened. He is not merely recognizing, acknowledging, classifying, forecasting, and treating another's affliction. He is encompassing it. By giving others the opportunity to share what they usually keep to themselves, he creates conditions under which trust can thrive. He is finding within the practice of an ancient healing art, not merely an opportunity to divert the path of a disease, but to forge a friendship. Brown is most assuredly a physician, a gentleman, and a scholar, but he is above all a human being in full. 
consider a much more recent portrait of the physician as a friend of man, that of the pseudonymous Dr. John Sassel in John Berger and Jean Moore's 1967 book, A Fortunate Man. Sassel practices in Western England's Forest of Dean. And in many ways, he differs sharply from the people and the community he cares for. He's different in birthplace, socioeconomic class, educational attainment, life experience. Sassel knows that in order to care for his neighbors, he must become one of them. And he does this by building something. There's a castle moat in town that has long been used as a dump. Sassel proposes that they turn it into a garden. He gets himself named the chair of the garden committee, but he defers to his neighbors who know a good deal more than he about how to design and build a garden. Eventually, after years of effort, during which he has labored at their side most summer evenings, the garden is complete. A neighbor, Sassel realizes, is one with whom I have labored side by side, working toward a shared vision. Not primarily through medical care, but through shared work. He ceases to be merely for them and lives among them, becoming one of them. Cicero famously said, if you have a garden and a library, you have just about everything. Thomas Brown builds a library. John Sassel builds a garden. But the library is not just a place of instruction, and the garden is not just a source of nourishing vegetables. In Brown's essays, we find objects every bit as rich and beautiful as a juicy red tomato. And in Sassel's garden lie lessons that every physician, and to a lesser extent every human being, is called upon to learn. In both cases, we must put asunder the things that should be separated and meld the things that should be joined, all in the service of healing, of making whole. Brown's prose and Sassel's garden teach us the meaning of patience, discipline, nurturance, resilience, and hope. They teach us that wisdom is not so much propositional as experiential, and that the essential experience is to recognize ourselves as part of something larger, deeper, and more enduring, something we can either ignore or embrace, thwart or cultivate. At some point, the most fitting response is not to beat our breasts, but to bow our heads. To see the connection between the liberal arts and medicine, we can turn to no finer recent guide than the greatest American physician poet, William Carlos Williams. In a chapter of his autobiography called The Practice, Williams shows us that doctoring and writing, medicine and the liberal arts, are twin aspects of the same calling. Of his encounters with patients, he writes, I lost myself, myself in the very properties of their minds. For the moment at least, I actually became them, whoever they should be, so that when I detached myself from them at the end of a half an hour of intense concentration over some illness which was affecting them, it was as though I were reawakening from a sleep. For the moment, I myself did not exist. Nothing of myself affected me. As a consequence, I came back to myself as from any other sleep rested. They naively asked, how do you do it? How can you carry on an active practice like that and at the same time find time to write? You must be superhuman. You must have, at the very least, the energy of two people. But they do not grasp that one occupation complements the other, that they are two parts of a whole, that it is not two jobs at all, that one rests the man if the other fatigues him. 
Forget writing. It's a trivial matter. But day in and day out, when the inarticulate patient struggles to lay himself bare for you, or with nothing more than a boil on his back, is so caught off balance that he re reveals a whole community's way of thought. A man is suddenly seized again with a desire to speak of the underground stream, which for a moment has just come up under surface. We catch a glimpse of something from time to time, which shows us that a presence has just brushed past us. Some rare thing, just when the smiling little Italian woman has left us. For a moment, we are dazzled. What was that? We can't name it. We know it never gets into any recognizable avenue of expression. Men will be long dead before they can have so much as ever approached it. Whole lives are spent in the tremendous affairs of daily events without ever approaching the great insights I see every day. We begin to see that the underlining meaning of all they want to tell us and have always failed to communicate is the poem, the poem which their whole lives are being lived to realize. No one will believe it. And it is the actual words as we hear them spoken under all circumstances which contain it. It is actually there in the life before us every minute that we are listening, a rarest element, not in our imaginations, but there, there in fact. It is that essence which is hidden in the very words which are going in at our ears and from which we must recover underlying meaning as realistically as we recover metal out of ore. And here we come to the end. If you care about money, perhaps go into business. If you care about power, perhaps go into politics. If you care about fame, become an entertainer. But if, as Dostoevsky puts it, you want not millions, but answers to your questions, and especially if you want to learn to pose even better questions, if, in other words, what you want above all is the truth, consider a career in the health professions. The truth lies not in textbooks or journal articles, and certainly not in the answers to standardized, high-stakes, multiple-choice test questions. The truth lies in the words of human beings stripped bare, confronted by life and death, ordinary people who sometimes quite unknowingly capture what most needs to be said in words of unsurpassed beauty. The liberal arts are meant to set us free, but they do so by means of the true. And to be free, we must encounter the truth. It is perhaps in medicine, more than just about any other calling, that the truth of humankind is exposed. As Tolstoy said, we find truth as we purify gold, not by adding to it, but by washing away all that is not gold. At its best, the practice of medicine represents both the calling and the consummation for which the liberal arts have always yearned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gondolin. We now have time for Q&A, so if you have a question. There are 
patients within the clinical setting. And you were talking about how uh, a physician, according to Thomas Brown, how they should encompass the uh, what they are going through in order to actually like have a better relationship with that patient. So I was just wondering, what can physicians do since they have such limited time in their practice to really connect with their patients? Great. The 18 seconds is not how long we have for a clinical encounter with a patient, but the amount of time we listen to a patient on average before we interrupt them. But the spirit of your question is bang on. Uh, the amount of time we have per patient has been declining. You know, maybe an office visit was once 20 minutes, then 15 minutes, now 12 minutes. What will it take to shave it down to eight? And it's not just a matter of diminishing time. It's a matter of distraction. Because when you encounter a patient, you're encouraged to... Uh, not only to listen to the patient, maybe not even primarily to listen to the patient, but to be thinking about things like uh, an ICD-10 code. Anybody know what an ICD-10 code is? ICD-10 stands for the International Classification of Diseases. I have to categorize this patient's complaints, symptoms, signs. Uh, otherwise, the visit doesn't count. CPT codes, cur current procedural terminology. Uh, that's what counts in healthcare today. If you want to learn what's most worth caring about, you need to spend some time in situations that draw your attention elsewhere because it's only in a deficit of what counts most that I think we can see most clearly what really counts for the most. So I come to you not as a, an emissary of a profession that is thriving. In many respects, we're at the pinnacle of the history of medicine, you know, in terms of the diagnostic tests we do, the therapies we can prescribe, our understanding of the anatomy, physiology, pathology, pathophysiology of human health and disease, We've never risen to this level, but at the very same moment, we're at uh, perhaps unprecedented risk of losing the human thread in medicine, attending to things that are secondary at, ex at the expense of those that are primary. So I would encourage you, uh, if you're contemplating a career in the health professions, uh, to get as good a liberal education as you can and then bring that education as a form of advocacy, beginning day one of medical school and carrying right through your undergraduate medical education and into residency and fellowship. We desperately need people who can see what matters most, who realize that not everything that can be counted really counts, and who realize that some of the things we spend a lot of time counting don't really count for much. So never, in, in, at least in my lifetime, has the need for liberally educated people in the health professions been greater. So that's, in a way, a call to arms, or at least a call to action. Uh, you can actually not only care for your patients, but you can diagnose and uh, administer therapy to the profession of medicine itself, which is not in the best of health in some respects. But by showing us what medicine looks like at its best, you can help us reconnect uh, with the core of medical excellence. Thanks again for your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming out to speak to us. For someone who is planning to go into the medical field and dealing with patients, no matter what, whether it's psychological, whether it's physical, how would you suggest that they best prepare themselves to face every patient with the same intentionality and care as they did the last one? It can get kind of exhausting to hear again and again, and you're bearing someone else's burdens. Yeah, that's a terrific problem. You know, uh, physicians and health professionals in general can burn out. You know, you can only work so many hours a day, only work at a certain pace. But I think one reason uh, that we face a challenge of burnout in healthcare today is because sometimes we are encouraged or perhaps forced to practice 
in ways that prevent us from caring for patients to the best of our ability. One of the most demoralizing things that can happen to you is to have a job you care about deeply and then be deprived of the opportunity to do it well. So I don't claim to have a panacea, you know, a cure-all that we can administer in this case, but I can imagine somebody before they enter the room with a patient pausing for a few seconds, uh, perhaps to offer a prayer, perhaps to uh, reorient and recalibrate to what this is really all about. In the hustle and bustle, sometimes we can get disoriented. I think that disoriented, disorientation is a big part of people getting discouraged and exhausted in medicine, and you can be one of the people. No, none of us is perfect. There's no foolproof solution, but you can be one of the people who pauses to recall what this is really all about before every patient encounter. And I firmly believe that can make a real difference, not only over the course of a day of practice, but over the course of a career of practice. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so during this time of COVID, per se, there is a, a greater emphasis on separating the elderly from the outside for their um, protection and for their safety. Um, Obviously, this contributes to a greater amount of like loneliness. Is there a relationship between um, the like the sickness and lo and loneliness? Like, are we doing more harm than good by separating the elderly from um, contact with uh, their loved ones or family? It's a great question. Uh, I may have this slightly wrong, but former U.S. Uh, uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy published a book, I think, in 2018 called The Epidemic of Loneliness. He basically uh, presented evidence that being lonely may be about as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. You know, that's a pretty serious uh, insult to your health. Uh, I, I do not think that captures the damage done by loneliness, to say it decreases our life expectancy or increases the number of days uh, lost from work only scratches the surface of a much deeper reality, but there is a recognition that loneliness is bad for human beings. After the world wars, there were large numbers of orphans in Europe, and uh, they were placed in institutions. You know, their diapers were changed, they were fed regularly, uh, the ambient temperature was right. Uh, but in many cases, they not only didn't grow and develop normally, but actually withered away. And for a time, that uh, syndrome was referred to as hospitalism. Today, we call it failure to thrive. But the lesson there is we human beings don't just need nutrients, adequate hydration, <laughs> sanitation, or hygiene. Uh, we also need human contact by which I mean in part touch. We human beings need to touch and be touched. And because of COVID, there are nursing home residents around the country who at points have been confined to their rooms for periods of time as long as months. And uh, you know, no visitors were allowed in the facility. We can do some things with tablet computers, <laughs> uh, various video conferencing software, but I think there's, in the end, no substitute for human touch. And I don't pretend to, have, pretend to have a simple solution, but we must make sure when we're thinking about things like death rates, number of years of lives lost, that we're also thinking about what life really means, what it takes to come fully to life, at least to the extent we can as human beings. And I think part of that is human contact. And that's actually a role that you could play to some degree. You may know somebody in your family, from your neighborhood, perhaps here in this town, perhaps on this campus who's lonely. And uh, each of us has it within our power uh, to reach out to one such person, you know, and let them know we're thinking about them, maybe even to schedule a conversation, if possible, perhaps even a visit. You do not need a bachelor's degree or an MD 
or a residency uh, certification to reach out to people, to let them know you're thinking about them, to let them know that you care about them. That's within the range of competence of every single person in this theater. And it's, it's a responsibility and an opportunity I would encourage you to take seriously. If you start doing that now, if you go to nursing school or dental school or medical school or what have you, you will bring much better habits. Habits of perception, of understanding, habits of the heart than uh, some of the rest of us did. You know, when we buffed up our GPAs and maxed out our medical college admission test scores. Those things are good, but they're not what matters most. And if you're one of the people who sees what matters most and has developed habits of reaching out to people to tend what matters most, uh, you can make very significant contributions to the healing professions. Please join me in thanking God for that.